Um, so I wanted to say this because this is what we have to still consider. And mentioning Maracana, incidentally, reminds one of an earlier pact between the elites. And I'm talking here about 1910 and the uh, understanding and agreement between the Afrikaner elite of that time, headed by its World War generals, Smuts and Boerta. And we see how that particular compact reveals yet again, so clearly as does Marukana, the fact that the state is put in the service of the mining houses in 1922 against the Afrikaner working class. And we see the continuum through to this day, notwithstanding our historic political settlement um, of 1994, which led to the 94 democratic election. So I think we have to be really prepared to accept a long view of how these forces and factors play themselves out in our country. Uh, it's not going to change that quickly. However, I am a believer uh, in the Leninist statement that at crucial crises in history, um, there could be an incredible speed up of, of events and turning points. And that's always possible. It's possible, I believe, in a world where 1%, and even far less than the 1%, has the benefit of the wealth of the rest of society. And the figure that came up the other day, that the top 85 wealthiest human beings have a share that is equivalent to half of humanity, 3 billion people. What kind of a world is this? What kind of a world is South Africa when miners are shut down, farm workers are shut down, people are shut down because they are the miners and the state does nothing and the ruling party does nothing and more and more people die by the gun uh, in protest demonstrations. I noted the other day, recently, reading one of the academic papers, actually, which we had this morning at the Frederick Edward Foundation, that um, in Bolivia, Morales sacked his mining minister uh, when 80 miners died, not at the hands of the state there, by the way, but at the hands of, uh, as a result of rival mining union, <coughs> the mining union rivalries. In South Africa, what do we see happening in terms of this class warfare? I would say more and more an elite, the political elite that has emerged at terms with the economic elite that has built up <coughs> during 140 years of diamond extraction and 120 years of gold extraction and other extraction of platinum and chrome and manganese and very little of that comes back to our people. Yes, there's rent for the elite, but not for those miners and not for the broad members of our society. And this cannot go on, these contradictions can't go on. And this is the political economy of South Africa, um, which as Nicholas has said, your paper attempts to give guidance for, and that's why I see it as not just another academic paper, but something, the kind of learning which must fuse with the working class of our country and with our people in general. And if we to discipline the capitalist parasites of this country, I'm talking about 1%, then we as a people have to ensure that there is change, that there is pressure, that we 
we, we make the country and its economy and its resources a benefit to all our people. And that will rise through the, the, the middle classes, incidentally, if we can create, as we must, a harmony in our country and get away from the class violence that has been at play for these hundreds of years in South Africa. I want to add that we of the liberation movement, and I'm talking about those in exile, in the prisons during apartheid, and internal to the country. Brave people like Carl and others at the universities and the black consciousness movement, etc. We were very optimistic that we would come through the phase of overthrowing apartheid and reaching national liberation in a very positive way, that we would be able to end the type of class rule that had dogged this country, a country of racial, colonial oppression and rule, uh, class rule. Um, we were optimistic because through particularly that last century with the mining revolution, and the impact of that on the economy. We had seen a proletariat emerge, a working class, uh, its trade union movement, its communist party, which was once worthy of that name, um, and that enormous tradition, uh, with tremendous support from abroad, including, whatever you might think of it, uh, the socialist enterprise of Eastern Europe, headed by the Soviet Union, Cuba, China, and so on. We were very optimistic. Um, I think if the Soviet Union had, had been able to exist, it wouldn't have been so easy, the political compromise that took place. But in actual fact, our optimism was naive and it was shattered by a very simple reality. And that is, was and is, the domination of capital in South Africa and its hegemony in terms of the means of production, distribution, exchange, trade, and so on in our country. But with it, its, um, its hegemony in terms of the question of profit-seeking, which filters through to everybody, the question of the corruption that grows with it. It's not the ANC, as some authors try to project, that brought corruption into South Africa from our little <coughs> settlements in Lusaka and a few different places. I had this debate with Alex Borain the other night in Cape Town because that's the gist of his book, Why South Africa Failed. The AMC brought corruption into our country. What nonsense. Um, this corruption has been here. It's out of the belly of capitalism and that hegemony which we underestimated, which we've got to deal with. I deal with a Faustian pact, as I call it, because we came 1994, we know the, um, the Reconstruction Development Program, which was on track very briefly. It was superseded by gear. You'll find the roots of this, not only because it goes way back to what I was talking about, your point about the 1970s and neoliberalism, but back to smuts and so on. And, and the military and, and the, 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 the mining energy complex it goes back to that uh, and their power and hegemony. But you see, that's an international factor as well because our dear leader, Madiba, who comes out of prison in 1990 in February and he says to the masses of the nation in that wonderful rally in Cape Town that um, the Freedom Charter and nationalization is what we stick to and we will never change. See, never say never in politics or life, by the way. Um, and within less than two years, he comes back from Davos and he tells us, as the leadership, ANC, Communist Party Alliance, he tells us, you know, guys, uh, I've spoken to the leaders of these Western powers and to all these captains of industry and so on, and they say to me, Mr. Mandela, you people take a radical socialist path, uh, you, you're heading for trouble, um, you're going to stagnate, you won't get direct foreign investment, you know, this neoliberal want uh, that's going to make 
all the difference. And Matifa has never been a socialist. And he's gullible of these things. And he comes back and that's it. And the rest of us accept this as he does for very good reasons. So I don't want to play games with you. We had a very dangerous situation in our country. We needed peace and stability to get through the threats of civil war and bloodshed. And that clearly is motivating the Deba. And the rest of us, those who think it turns into two stages of liberation, first the political, and then once you've got political power, you can change the economic um, from Slovo to the rest of us. We accept that. But the Faustian pact is something, you give that away. So you've got political leverage, and you don't have the economic. Well, you see these vultures out of little Brenthurst and the Rembrandt group and their friends abroad. That elite have got centuries of experience behind them and all through throughout the world and they know the game. And they can see that the prescription is very right and ready in our dear old country to bring to the fore that new elite. And the surprise one has as the flock of our people get into the, the trough and take up the rent and take up this new situation. Whether you're a Zuma with four wives and 24 kids and it's absolutely vital that you get your, your trough into the rent. Or whether you're guys who previously claimed to be socialists of one you or another are very, very excited coming out of absolute poverty and with nothing in the bank and no property. I had that argument with Slova because Slova was the only person from the leadership who accepted Medeba's suggestion that we cut the salaries of, of, of ministers and MPs and it in a revolt. And Joe Matisi, Ruth Monparty, said to me, go to your friend Joe, that we don't have property, we don't have money in the bank, so we need that particular salary level. They, they put it that way, frankly. And I said to Joe, just remember you know, what you've got in the bank account. I'll finish now. Um, it's, it's these things, it's a bit anecdotal that you have to bring on board. And um, it's then the question, given how we've actually found ourselves in this predicament and what cronyism, capitalism means, uh, um, cronyism, corruption, etc. means, how certainly this indisciplined capitalist class who won't give anything uh, need to be taught a lesson. And the whole situation needs to be reversed. And it's not as though we were as strong as we were in 1994. We were far stronger then than Medeba made out. Um, but as we speak now, there is no way in our country that this pact of the elites can resolve the contradictions of the poor, the dispossessed, the marginalized, the mine workers, etc. So, as in Bolivia, as in Venezuela, as in other countries, even in Botswana, which is by no means anywhere near those Latin American countries, where at least they've got a grip on, on the mineral wealth of their country and what they can derive from it for their people. Um, unless we can do that, unless we can have the courage to understand what nationalization is about, that it can be used badly by elites who want to bring in bureaucratic managers and bureaucratic trade unionists to run it, Eastern Europe or anywhere else as examples, or nationalization where you have the working class involved and given capacity and given skills and you change the whole dimension to put your mineral wealth as Venezuela and other countries have, at the service of your people. And I'm not saying full-blown socialism on the end now. I'm talking about putting the capitalists in their place to play according to the rules, which will help the middle class of this country as well, because we get harmony out of that. Um, but in order that that comes about, you've got to have organized force.
you've got to have the emergence of a left in this country, which is a left that can fuse with the masses. I said fuse, not confuse. Eh? They can <laughs> work and, and capture that support of the masses, not as an elite. They can bring the required pressure and demands on changing the political economy of South Africa into something that's really helpful for our people. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks for the paper. Those are the thoughts that stood in my mind. Thank you. Thank you. basis of the property.